Right, so let's look at uh, some more details about uh, hurricanes. I said that uh, we need ocean energy uh, for uh, making the hurricane grow with this evaporative feedback from the ocean to the winds. Uh, what else is happening within a hurricane? Once it's well formed, uh, satellites and aircraft, for example, clearly see the eye. It's very well defined low pressure center. Uh, typically the size is about uh, 200 kilometers, but there are, have been uh, some hurricanes that have grown to be as large as 800 kilometers. As I said, with the question with global warming is what is happening to the hurricanes? How quickly are they growing? Uh, how intense they are getting and so on and so forth. The eye of the hurricane is the low pressure center and it has these spiral bands. So remember it's going counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere because flow around the low pressure system is counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. You can again do it using your basic Coriolis understanding. And within the eye uh, there is actually cool, dry air sinking and the evaporation and rain and the condensation heating feedback is all happening in these spiral bands of uh, rain. So here is a satellite image that is showing uh, an eye that is not so well defined but the spiral bands of rain can be seen. This is already being falling apart because it's already hit land and you can see these outer bands of rain are already on land which means it's already losing the energy from the ocean. But when it's in the open ocean and it's very strong, this eye can be very well defined. Okay, So the uh, closest band of rain around the eye is called the eye wall. And these days, because of the warm ocean temperatures, many things are happening, like what is called rapid intensification. Essentially, the eye wall is beginning to get so much energy from the warm ocean that it is intensifying very rapidly. There are definitions of uh, how quickly the winds have to accelerate, something like 55 km per hour uh, acceleration within a 24-hour period and so on and so forth. This makes the, the, the predictions very difficult because it's just coming along and it suddenly can grow incredibly intense. This happened in the 2020 uh, pre-monsoon cyclone season for cyclone Amphan which went into the Bay of Bengal uh, and Kolkata and cyclone Nisarga which started in the Arabian Sea and ran into uh, Alibab uh, area for example has also happened last year for the cyclones that happened uh, in the pre-monsoon season and the post-monsoon season. So there are a lot of questions about are the number of pre-monsoon cyclones increasing? For example, if a cyclone is forming in June as uh, Nisarga did and Wayu did last year, the question is what do they do to the monsoon? But also we said monsoon circulation should make it harder for the cyclones to grow, but why are we having cyclones so close to the monsoon season in June? Uh, how is it related to the warming of the ocean and the circulation change of uh, the monsoon uh, and so on and so forth. Incredibly uh, complicated questions but something you must keep in mind uh, as you go forward. Um, what are the other factors? Warmer waters favor hurricane development so warming the ocean just means you are probably uh, favoring the cyclones, uh, at least their intensification rates. And there is a kind of out-of-phase relationship between the Atlantic and Pacific hurricanes. Depends on when the favorable conditions happen, where the ITCZ is, what are the cyclogenesis processes. Cyclogenesis is basically a index that's created using various things like the sea surface temperature, the winds, uh, st wind structure in the atmosphere, the amount of humidity in the atmosphere, and so on, to say when the cyclones are likely to be born. So those conditions are out of phase between the Atlantic and hurricane seasons, but with global warming, if the season begins to get longer, then obviously that overlap is going to increase between the two um, hurricane seasons in the Pacific and the Atlantic, right? Wind shear is important. It, wind shear is basically the change in the direction of the wind or the strength of the wind from the surface towards the troposphere and tropopause. Okay? What happens? Essentially, the cyclone is trying to maintain a counterclockwise circulation and a coherent structure. 
but the winds if they change and become very strong they can chop off the head of the cyclone and take away the energy and make uh, it difficult for the cyclone to grow so strong wind shear can suppress the, the cyclone growth for example and this happens <coughs> over the Atlantic when El Nino actually changes the circulation over the Atlantic in such a way as to reduce the number of uh, hurricanes. We haven't defined El Nino and La Nina yet. We will do that in the next chapter, but I think some of you are already aware, so I'm just going to leave those terminologies in there. But cyclones are also affected by what happens from year to year. So El Nino and La Nina don't happen every year. They're called interannual modes of climate variability and they can affect cyclones which happen every year okay so hurricane destruction is not just the high winds the, the scale we looked at it's not just the intense rainfall that is associated with these rain bands but it's also the storm surge because as the circulation is happening around the cyclone uh, the front end can be pushing the ocean in and the back end can be taking the ocean out away from the coast so a lot of water is being pushed onto land and the coastal uh, regions obviously get uh, inundated a lot. What happens under global warming? If oceans is, are warming, the sea level is increasing. We will look at that later on. If the sea level is rising, more water can come in because of the cyclones. So again, there is a different relation uh, between global warming and cyclone damage as well in addition to the number of cyclones, intensity, rate of intensification, and so on. So many examples ex exist of storm destruction. Billions and billions of dollars are lost every year because of cyclones. People like to live near the coast, so you can easily cannot easily convince them to move away from the coasts because of sea level rise, inundation, cyclones, and so on. So if the ocean keeps warming, cyclones could also be uh, beginning to get born further north than just the deep tropics, right? ITCZ could expand, could move north, tropics could expand, get warmer, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> before about 1950, the cyclones didn't have names. Now the World uh, Meteorological Organization organizes the names of typhoons, cyclones, and hurricanes. So the biggest storm recorded before uh, that had historical impacts uh, was the Galveston, Texas storm that killed some 6,000 people, then Hurricane Andrew in 92, uh, Mitch 98, Katrina, which became a poster child for what global warming could bring in terms of sea level rise, human habitation close to the coast, uh, degradation of natural coastal defenses like mangroves which can damp the waves that are being brought in by the cyclone and so on and so forth. Hurricane Ike, Hurricane Irene and rec more recently we have had Hurricane Francis, Dorian and so on and so on. The story just continues. So cyclones, it's a very complicated topic. I made a very brief and quick uh, introduction because this is not an advanced course. But anybody who's interested can easily follow up with uh, Google and so on. And there is lots and lots of information online about uh, hurricanes and global warming impact and so on. 